And with that, we're going to a super hot topic. Uh, NFTs are like absolutely like on top of like everybody's mind right now. And our next speaker is is a fantastic expert in that. So Q Harrison Terry has a remarkable background as an entrepreneur and a globally recognized marketing expert. He's a growth marketer at Mark Cuban Companies, where he advises and assists portfolio companies with their marketing strategies. And he's also an author of the NFT Handbook. So previously, he led marketing at Redox and has been featured in numerous publications, such as the Huffington Post, and a regular speaker at events as uh, CES, South by Southwest, and TEDx. Um, and I think his topic is going to be super interesting for many people in the audience. And he will share his learnings for selling NFTs for 121 Ethereum versus 0.0121 Ethereum. Please all welcome Q Harrison. Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? I uh, am Q. Harrison Terry. It's very early in the morning here, but we're going to get through this presentation and, and get everything up to speed. I imagine myself coming into some nice uh, energy as we get, get started and get going. If you have any questions or would like to know more, we're going to be doing a brief Q&A at the end of this presentation. So please drop those comments in the, in the chat and I will see you after this presentation. Now, for those that don't know, I've been in the NFT space and just the, the digital art space for quite a while. I did my first ever transaction in digital art in 2015 and then moved on uh, for several years just watching and observing the space. Uh, started a company in the digital art space known as 23Vivi, uh, raised money for that and you know saw that go from you know its, its inception all the way to us ultimately sunsetting that company. But I learned a lot about what it takes to sell digital art that's protected by a blockchain. And here we are in 2021, where we're looking at NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And this year alone, we've seen several billion dollars just transacted on these non-fungible tokens. And in my essence of looking at you know non-fungible tokens and just kind of sharing what I've learned per se from selling and uh, researching and just taking notes in the space, I've gotten to a point where I've kind of landed on, in order to do any of this, you have to have this futuristic outlook and you have to really be able to describe, you know, what is the future of NFTs? And, and for me, that's this presentation. I'm going to be going through kind of what I've learned while selling NFTs, but really what has kept me abreast, like the, the best advice I can share, because what worked in February is not going to work in September of 2021. You know, what worked in June is also not going to work in September of 2021. This space is just moving way too rapidly. But what is true is just the future is an outlook where you can kind of build what you want. And because it's moving so fast, uh, if you start today and you get going and you get an idea, you get a concept, but around the time you've probably finished or narrowed in where you want to be with that concept, the industry will be just about ready for you. So thanks again for joining me today. We're about to get into the future of NFTs. If you have any questions, again, drop them in the comments and I'll see you in the Q&A afterwards. So the first really big construct that I have to address before we get into NFTs is the whole concept of why we collect. So if you've ever been a collector of anything, you probably know this whole concept of speculation, right? Uh, we see it a lot with the stock market. Uh, and, and when you look at art, there's more of an emotional tie to it. Do you like the artist? Do you like uh, the, the painting? Does it speak to you? Do you like just the masterpiece in general? And then there's FOMO, you know, the fear of missing out. If you were missing out on the wave, no one wants to, to be that person that got left behind. And so you start to see people collect or follow trends because they don't want to miss out on what the next thing is. And then finally, there's this whole concept of the thrill of the hunt. And that is, you know, I want to find the next best thing, because if I find the next best thing, then I'll be able to uh, just kind of collect in, 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 in like knowing that I'm ahead. I'm, I'm now a curator amongst my peer group and my my social status. And so at the core of collecting is scarcity. And no matter what we collect, we do it because, you know, once you own it, 
someone else can't. And after spending a whole lot of time on NFTs, that's largely what's driving it. It's these NFTs are digital scarce objects that have the opportunity to have appreciation happen. And we haven't really seen this uh, outside of this decade where a digital file has true value, where a digital file can be transacted um, in a non-fungible way. And what most gets to me is, you know, 99% of NFTs are lottery tickets. And what do I mean by that? I mean that 99% of the NFTs that you're probably going to interact with or buy or consume just probably won't see that appreciation that a lot of people talk about. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that's what's true at the moment. So you might wonder, you know, is there an NFT bubble? Like, is this whole NFT marketplace thing just a a quick cash grab? You know, I've heard a lot of comments uh, specifically around what NFTs are for the, the, the industry at large. And, you know, there are a lot of comments. Me personally, I do think that the comparables to the early internet companies in the late 90s is fair. I also think that, you know, there are a lot of NFT projects. And because there are so many projects, there's this whole concept of there being a race to be this gra- to reach this grailed status. Um, and what grailed is, is it becomes so crucial to the NFT history that your collectors will do anything to keep the NFT's value alive. And we've seen a few projects become grailed. You know, the Board Ape Yacht Clubs, uh, we have the art, art blocks, we've got, you know, the CryptoPunks and, and, and so many others, right? Like, um, they've reached this whole concept of grailed. And this is interesting to see because once you reach this status, you really have a community and the community then just keeps the value alive. And I think, you know, that's the first point I want to share with you all. If you're going to create a NFT or thinking about it, really think about who you're making that NFT for and what is the community that's collecting this project. If you don't have a a community that's going to really, uh, you know, just care long term, NFTs might not be the best path forward for you at this moment because, you know, the whole concept of just collecting NFTs, I think that that is already in the past, right? And and the co-founder of OpenSea has also said something very similar, right? What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to associate that NFT with something in addition to it, right? So there has to be some level of excitement that's attached to your project. And, there are a few projects that show us that, right? So the first that I want to cover today are blockchain and, and play to earn games. I think that this will carry us through the next few dips in the NFT market because they are probably the most stickiest use case in NFTs that we know today. So what exactly is a play to earn game and why do they look much different than the video games we've come to know and love? Well, This little uh, icon you can see here on my screen, that's an Axie from Axie Infinity. Axie Infinity is probably the most notable blockchain game. Uh, If you want to make money, uh, you you can go on YouTube. You can see a lot of tutorials on, you know, how to uh, create scholars and teams and just, you know, how how to earn crypto from playing this game. But at its core, there's three main elements that I think are interesting to pay attention to. One is ownership. The second is, you know, an exchangeable currency. And the third is wealth building. I think the ownership permits, uh, one, this whole concept of these are my digital items. These are my digital, this is my digital collection, right? The exchangeable currency lets me know that I'm not wasting my time. So in this game, I can, you know, take the tokens and exchange that into Ethereum or Bitcoin. And then last but not least, because I can exchange that token into tokens that will ideally appreciate at some point in the future, I can get that that wealth build, building, right? So you get that momentum. And every hour spent in Axie Infinity translates into real earnings. Whether you're increasing the value of your Axie, breeding new Axies, or earning SLP, which is the in-game token, time in Axie equals real-world money. So what do you do? When you get tired of playing Axie, well, you could continue earning. You could create a scholarship, which allows people to uh, play the game for you. And then you do this 50-50 rep split, which is absurd. Imagine that you made a really, a really 
big character in Fortnite, um, and you had all these these collectibles, but you just got tired of the game. You could give, you could then lend your account to someone, and then they could earn, you know, the in-game currency and and still keep your status alive, but you don't have to play it. That's it. That's an interesting model. We're seeing that in play to earn games. You know, you could also uh, sell all your axes. So if you built up this really cool digital collection of collectibles, and and you want to go further than that you can just kind of exit the game and someone will probably give you real world money uh, for that and if you don't want to sell you can also trade it for other nfts right like this is one of the things that is available to people that are in these blockchain games and play to earn spaces because the value system is different there's just a a, a vast difference from the options that you would have when you're playing a comparable game such as nda 2k or even halo for example right and I think the future of gaming is scarce ownership, right? Uh, what I mean by that is when you have all of these in-game items and you have all of these things that are associated with traditional play-to-earn video games, uh, you you can create these real worlds that have the, these real wor- these real virtual worlds that have true value within uh, the items that are in, that are exchanged within the game. And we're get, starting to get really meta this morning, but just follow along with me before I get to the next points. I do want to shout out kind of two blockchain games. Uh, I'll talk about, we've already talked about, uh, what is it called? Axie Infinity. They have Guild of Guardians. And then there's another one called Ember Sword. You can check out the slides uh, after this presentation and you can do a little bit more research yourself. But to keep everything kind of on, on, on track, I want to talk about the next thing that NFTs have showed me just as I'm selling and, and finding the value there. And that is, you know, NFTs for club access Uh, memberships and funding. What you've probably heard is these are what we call access NFTs. And these NFTs allow you to access the network and reap the rewards. Um, Access tokens entice buyers first through their value. So one of the value props here is, you know, exclusivity, right? And, And just that whole concept of having an exclusive community or an experience or even a giveaway, like only the people that hold this NFT can participate in that, that giveaway. But ultimately it's the second order effect of access tokens that makes the network of members, um, what I think really, really strong. It basically becomes an entry point for a legacy brand or new NFT creators that want an easily play like an easel an easy entry point as it relates to you know kind of engaging in this NFT metaverse. And so uh, there's a few people that have done this really well. I think uh, Dirt, which is the first newsletter funded by NFTs, uh, what they did is they utilized this NFT that you see on screen to, to fund the mission. So they said, hey, we need to create uh, some money for our newsletter so that way we can pay writers and we can uh, have staff and we have this idea of creating this entertainment-based newsletter. Uh, however, we want everyone to enjoy the benefits, but we want our token holders to know that they funded this mission and and because they did that, you know, this, this, this is possible. And so I think that's an early example of funding tokens, right? So what, what this is, is, you know, NFTs are redefining how media of all kinds is funded from comics to cartoons to newsletters and more. The model of funding through NFT rewards uh, with the tradable collectible it creates a, a different type of ownership, right? You're, you can you can fund your company without giving up equity. Uh, you have a way to create a profit sharing uh, mechanism or grant exclusive access to a media product or uh, just a team and create a more intimate experience, not only with your fans, but the actual uh, people that are engaging with your stuff in general. And so I look at this chart and it might be a little hard for you to see it, but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of call this out a little bit. You know, if there's a scarce number of access tokens or funding tokens, then the cost of the access tokens reflects the demand. So if you only have, let's say, 100 uh, access tokens that are going to allow you to fund a project, and so that means there can only be 100 people that ever uh, can say that they've supported you well, the cost of the access reflects in that demand. And then the network of members creates a value for, for one another, right? So if you keep buying the tokens and there's a lot of one-of-one tokens out there, uh, what happens is the demand for the access uh, to the network grows because people take pride in being a, a patron or a supporter. And 
there's a few more use cases I want to get through before we get uh, done with this presentation. And the, the next one is, you know, claiming your blockchain identity or domain name, as some would call it. If you were to type in qharrison.eth in a Brave browser, it might take you to my website. If you were to type in qharrison.eth in an Ethereum wallet uh, because you want to send me Ethereum or whatever, guess what? Instead of having this long string of numbers, I, I have this NFT that it basically shortens my, my contract address for me, my wallet address. And blockchain domains are essentially suites of smart contracts that can direct to various blockchain-related activities, and they work as a naming registry, replacing those 42-character crypto wallet addresses that we all have. You know, they can direct people to websites, emails, Twitter, and more. And essentially, it's a building block of a basic internet function that will become ubiquitous in just a few years. So today, if you see someone that has a .eth domain, they might look a little odd. I think in just four to five years from now, it will be just as common as someone sharing their cash app tag on the internet. And this is a screenshot of someone that literally just posted on Twitter, uh, hey, you know, this is my cash app, support me. And so, you know, people will then come to say, you know, what premium blockchain domains do you own? Very similar to the whole concept of owning uh, domains in the real world. And so these are just, you know, my thoughts on what these marketplaces will, will be, uh, what NFTs will, will have impact in, in the near future. And I think that uh, when I look at it a little bit, uh, from a, when I think about it from another perspective, I think that the next year of NFTs will bring uh, probably not as crazy prices and, 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 and price points, but I think what it will do is it will establish a baseline for what a utility NFT is. I think this year was definitely the ICO era of NFTs. So we saw a lot of projects, a lot of people doing a lot of incredible things, but uh, there was definitely a lot of hype. There was a lot of projects that I don't think will be able to cross the chasm, not because the community isn't there, but maybe the community leaves. Maybe the idea becomes less interesting as time goes on. And it's just notable for, or it's natural for people to evolve and progress and, and go to other state, uh, spaces. So that is that concludes this presentation. I'll be speaking a little bit more in depth on NFTs uh, just here momentarily, but I do want to get to the Q&A. And uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Th th thank you so much, uh, Kier Harrison. That was fantastic and uh, and a great primer on uh, how you got into the space and the super exciting NFT space. So uh, as Kier Harrison said, for all the people in the audience, if you're on Hopin, you can click on sessions and then Q&A with Kier Harrison, where he'll be right in two minutes. So with that, Kier Harrison, I'll let you jump over to the Hopin link. Thank you so much.